Hello. Hey, this is Pete Pizzatello. Thank you for joining us today on the Broadband Bunch Zero Touch Learning Series. Actually, this is Pete Pizzatello. There you go. Um, as you know, it's been a challenging time for a lot of us to uh, stay connected to our uh, community and our uh, partners. And so, you know, we've, we were looking forward to this session today um, to help solve that problem, right? Uh, we've all been figuring out how to work from home and hopefully we can continue in this really important industry um, that the world has got a spotlight on right now to figure out how to do it uh, better, more effectively, and how to learn from the situation that we're in. So kicking off, I'm happy to uh, invite um, Heather Gold to be our moderator today. The topic we'll be digging into is surviving and thriving while maintaining social distance. We have some really interesting uh, collection of panelists that Heather will uh, introduce and go through today. The session's planned to be about an hour, a little bit longer. Um, you know, some of the goals um, that we're we're interested in is is um, making it interactive. Uh, so we hope that you will do that through the chat function. If you have any technical issues, also the chat function's um, available for you to submit questions to Heather and to the panelists. Um, as I mentioned, this is a series. There's a couple other on the radar um, that you that you might be interested in around telemedicine. I'm not going to walk through all those, but you can find them all on our website. Um, and lastly, you know, as I mentioned, this is an interactive. We don't want this to be kind of a one-sided uh, webinar conversation, just reading from slides. We'll use a couple slides to set up the conversation, but then make it as dynamic as possible. We ask you to par participate if you can. Uh, we will be recording this session. And um, if there's any ideas or if you were going to be a panelist, um, you know, if there's any topics that you would love to, to for us to dig into, you know, please reach out to us. We want to make sure that we're talking um, about relevant topics that uh, that you all are interested in. And then, lastly, just a shameless plug here: you know, if you are interested um, to follow us, you know, on Facebook or through our ETI's blog, uh, as well as on the Optics newsletter from uh, Fiber Fiber Broadband, we're releasing um, interviews and uh, discussions weekly, um, and hopefully, you guys find them valuable. So, with that, I'm going to hand it back to Heather. Heather, thanks for joining us today. I'm looking forward to a great conversation. Thanks, Pete, and welcome everyone um, from your home or home office or wherever you are. And um, it's my pleasure to moderate this panel today. And I think we're all well aware that currently there are 45 states where school systems have been closed primarily through the end of the, most of them through the end of the school year. And that equates to 118,000 K through 12 schools and 54 million kids. And then when you add in higher education, that brings in hundreds and thousands, hundreds of other institutions and thousands of other students. So one of the things we want to investigate today is how has the what kind of impact has been this uh, closure on the educational system for the U.S. and for the students themselves? Um, what fault lines in learning have we emerged as we have attempted to go online? Um, today we're joined by five professionals who have seen all aspects of distance learning from deploying the networks that have been made possible in a rural location to researchers who have studied the disparities in access, both in terms of devices and in terms of broadband and how they've impacted these students. And finally, and last but not least, we have a real live person on the front line, a middle school administrator who has helped, helped his school get ready and implement an online strategy um, that will last at least through the end of the school year. So let me introduce everyone quickly. Um, first, we have Todd Way, um, who's CEO of Doug Douglas Fastnet, a for-profit broadband subsidiary of Douglas Electric Cooperative, which operates in rural Southeast Oregon. Douglas Fastnet started as FTTH network by using E-rate funding to build connectivity to its 13 school systems throughout the area. Next is Johannes Barr, who is the director of the Quello Center for Media and Technology, um, which is a division of, of uh, Media and Technology Policy, which is a division of Michigan State. Um, most recently, the center has published its finding on broadband and student performance gaps. Then we'll have Pierrette Rene Drag, who is director of marketing and communications at the Merit Network, which is the nation's largest running research and education network, which operates in Michigan. 
Garrett has been active in research on the digital, digital divide and enabling communities to deploy their own fiber optic networks, and most recently, through her PhD studies in understanding the cultural and social studies, social divides created through online learning in higher education. Then we have Erin Huggins, who's a research associate at the research and evaluation team at the Friday Institute for Educational Innovation at North Carolina State. While involved in evaluating many projects under the Friday Institute, her current evaluation work includes work with the Homework Gap Hotspot Initiative, whereby rural areas are trying to augment broadband access by giving families hotspots. And then we have Nick Fisher, who's a middle school administrator in a suburban DC district that announced in March it was closing through the rest of the school year. Nick was instrumental in getting his kids and teachers ready for the rest of the year online experience. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to each of my speakers to do a brief introduction of their backgrounds and what they're involved in. And we're going to start with Todd. Well, good morning. Um... Hi, I'm Todd uh, Way from uh, Douglas Fastnet in Roseburg, Oregon. Uh, next slide, please. A um, little bit about this, Heather already covered it. We're a uh, for-profit uh, broadband provider. We're actually owned by an electric cooperative, which is a nonprofit business, so that's a little bit different. Um, headquartered in Roseburg, Oregon. Uh, we've actually been in business since 2001. Uh, a little bit different than some of the co-ops that you hear about deploying broadband in that we serve more customers and have more fiber plant outside of the co-ops territory than inside, um, which comes into play in this uh, um, broadband discussion here. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as Heather mentioned, uh, we've built our network um, heavy, uh, leveraging uh, E-rate over the years. And so here's a map of what we, we serve right now. Uh, 17 school districts, uh, 60 school locations, those are elementary schools, high schools, uh, alternate learning facilities, um, prisons or child prisons, um, things like that. Uh, mainly what we do is we provide connectivity back to the ESDs and uh, the internet access for the, for the school districts. Next slide, please. Talking about COVID, um, this one caught everybody off guard. Uh, I love this quote from Ostica at our local ESD, talking about the need for uh, robust broadband, low latency, high capacity. Uh, the challenge has been how to connect those who are way out there, no cell signal or otherwise. Even if we do provide a hotspot, the avail available bandwidth has not been enough in households that have more than one student. We have been promoting video conferencing and streaming to get the lessons where they can be more engaging, but the bandwidth and latency limitations have worked against us. Uh, we're, we're hearing that everywhere, Douglas County, Coos County, Lane County, all the school districts are having the same issue. Um, we've been having students learn from home. My students have been learning from home since March. Uh, in early April, when it became apparent that this was going to be an extended uh, stay at home, learn from home experience, we launched DFN Cares, uh, providing bandwidth to low-income students and including the, the wireless router. Um, so far, 75 orders have been placed and about half of those have been installed. In a lot of cases, we're talking uh, thousand foot type drops uh, up the side of mountains or, or long country driveways, so it's not an easy task. Uh, additionally, we've signed the FCC's Keep America Connected pledge and are uh, delaying uh, turning off folks for non-pay and uh, uh, for giving late charges. Next slide. Um, we're seeing an increase in new orders as a result of this. I think we had a lot of folks out there that were living off their cell phone signal. And now that you have to rely on bandwidth and you have to rely on quality bandwidth, uh, we're seeing the need for uh, connectivity. And uh, we're not just, we're seeing higher packages being bought as well. Uh, lots of uh, service calls for wireless where you may have had an old uh, wireless router. We're now doing hotspots throughout the home, pucks, uh, mesh net, those types of products. Uh, we've been tracking bandwidth and we've seen a four gig gigabit increase during working hours. Um, we, we haven't seen any slowdowns, mainly we're sized for a Friday night anyways, but we've definitely, definitely seen the uptick during the day. Uh, there's lots of economic need and there's a lot of community support out there to help bring broadband to these students and teachers. Next slide. 
And thank you. Thanks, Todd. Um, Johannes. Johannes is on mute. I thought you would. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Johannes Bauer. I'm director of the Crawler Center at Michigan State University. Our goal is our mission is to connect academic researchers with our practitioners and carry out our research that help with practical issues. I'll be briefly talking about uh, a study that we did um, uh, last year with uh, uh, Merit uh, was one of the partners, Merit Network. Uh, Merit will speak after me but also several uh, districts across Michigan and the many, many schools. So there's quite a number of people who were involved in making this happen. And our goal was to understand better, this is under normal conditions, so to speak, not under COVID-19 conditions, how uh, variances in connectivity influence uh, student outcomes. And I have to do a shout out to my colleague, Keith Hampton, who is a professor in my department too at Michigan State University who took the academic lead to do this. Next slide, please. So what we did is we worked with three intermediate school districts, uh, a total of 21 schools uh, in 15 school districts and 173 classrooms to uh, survey them and, and uh, find out what the effects were of different types of connectivity. And there's a lot of initiative uh, across the United States and many initiatives who try to use online uh, measurements and online data to answer that question. We realized we couldn't actually use that method because that misses the people who are not connected at all. So what we designed is a three-legged approach. Uh, on the one hand, we used uh, a, a very detailed in-class survey, a paper survey that students filled out. So that captured the online population and the offline population. Then we used um, speed measurement data that in Merit was extremely helpful uh, to make those uh, available uh, using the MLAB platform. So we had objective network measurement data for those who were connected among the group. And then finally, the schools worked with us uh, to give us um, standardized test scores for the individuals that were in the survey and, and did the homework. Uh, assignment and did the speed test and all the data is completely de-identified so we do not know who those individuals are the schools are the only ones that the data trustees in this case and then if you go to the next slide please i'll share quickly what our main findings were first of all we saw that uh expectedly right the the number of students in rural areas uh the left uh, one of those three cycles circles uh much less connected than those in in urban or in suburban areas and so the, the connectivity means that students have fast broadband access so the green uh, part without access means that they have uh slower types of broadband access and it's 47 percent in rural areas 30 percent in urban areas and then uh, the, the, not surprisingly the best served are suburban areas go to the next slide please and here we see the, some of the key findings of the, of the report, and, and they were more severe and more uh, clear than, than we had anticipated. One was that there's very, very strong differences depending on your connectivity in all, overall GPA. So the, the graph on the lower left-hand side shows four levels of access, fast access, slow access, no access, and then cell phone only access. And I'll say, I'll say a few more things about this in, in a moment. What we do find is that uh, students without access or, to our surprise, with cell phone only access, so they do not have a complementary device, they do not have a tablet or, or a notebook computer that they run through a hotspot, so they use their smartphone to solve homework uh, assignments. Those actually do as bad or in some cases even worse than those without access. And the difference to those who have fast internet access is actually half a grade point in terms of the GPA. That could mean significant implications for your life. Right? It's scholarships sometimes, whether you get the scholarships going forward or not will depend on, on that level of, uh, of, of grade differences. They rank lower on standardized test scores. So we looked at SAT and PSAT scores. I'd be happy to say more in the discussion. And they're less likely to attend college. And then the last one, please. Move to the next, yes. Um, 
these students with um, slow or low no access uh, are less likely to be a stem oriented career the, the the label is missing on this graph for some reason it's the same fast is, is the left hand bar um, slow is the left middle no is the right middle and then cell is the is the, the very right one um, and and um, one of the surprising findings was that cell phones cell phone students were um, more as, as poor as, as others. And, and one of the reasons, there's multiple reasons for it, right? I mean, some data caps, for example, QP1 plants, they have temporarily been lifted, uh, of course, but also that the device as such is less capable of supporting the type of work that students are doing. And, um, and so I think there's a big issue there. I mean, uh, in the end, the bottom line really of our findings is that it's there's clearly an effect of infrastructure access. Uh, so infrastructure access does matter. Uh, for for rural and small town areas in Michigan, um, but there's three other conditions that are in play that we'll we'll have to address going forward. One is individuals have to have the right devices, uh, and and so so the notion that cell phone smartphone access alone can solve the problem is is probably misleading. Furthermore, teachers, students, and parents need to have the right skill set to handle online education. Right, access is one important precondition. But if the parents, if the teachers, if the students don't have the skills to use online teaching and learning, uh, the effects will be will be much weaker. Finally, in many cases, this is these are areas that we are exploring right now. In many cases, most likely the curriculum, the pedagogy would also have to be adapted uh, to these online conditions. So thank you. This this was all I wanted to say at this point, and then look forward to the discussion. Here at. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. All right, we're good to go? Yep, just can't see Excellent. you. That's okay. I do want to apologize for that. I'm having a little bit of connectivity issues here, as I'm sure a lot of us are in some of these cases. Johannes mentioned uh, there's two things I want to talk about today, one of which is the Michigan Moonshot, and this is a project that Merit Network has been working on in partnership with the Quello Center at MSU and MLab. And this is one way we've been working to impact the connectivity issue, particularly the homework gap and other areas in Michigan. And one thing that we're working on right now is looking at deploying both surveys and speed tests to understand who in Michigan is connected and at what speed. And we're also providing uh, very deep and robust community resources. So if you go to merit.edu slash moonshot, our nonprofit organization, which is the longest running research and education network in the state of Michigan, has developed a robust set of tools for communities, municipalities, policymakers, educators, and interested citizens to be able to understand how to plan, build, run, and secure a community network. One of these tools happens to be a step-by-step -step guide to planning, building, and running a network, along with 700 pages of resolutions and resources and documentation in order to be able to do that. And all of these materials and webinars have been developed for people who may or may not be new to technology. So there's a pretty low barrier to be able to actually understand some of the materials and take the first steps within your community. Uh, next slide, if you would. Another thing that I wanted to talk about today on this webinar, and it's a little bit more um, focused on higher education, is online learning, particularly what's going on now uh, during COVID. If you would go on, Pete. I'm going to move through these very quickly, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to follow up with me. Uh, we all know that the problem is that uh, all of our higher education institutions have been forced to transition very rapidly to online learning. And our administration, schools, and educators have been forced to in, in scramble to provide online learning to be able to provide continuity of education. And uh, some researchers, both in Michigan and Ohio and myself, are taking part in understanding what these barriers to success are particularly for socioeconomically challenged students. One of our early findings that we found in our literature reviews was that as many as 35% of socioeconomically challenged students 
and this uh, unfortunately equates to primarily students of color, uh, really face some potential issues as far as attrition, and they may even have to drop out due to uh, the lack of resources, the lack of support, and the lack of connectivity of college, and will at that point likely not re-enroll. Um, if you would go to the next slide. Some of the barriers that we have identified so far and also hypothesized include we're looking at both the lived physical and emotional realities of these students. So in terms of technology, barriers are internet access and affordability, the availability of devices, digital literacy skills. So just because you have a computer and access does not mean that you know how to use them effectively to learn. The lived physical realities of increased head household demands, the potential realities of caring for, caring for aging parents, and also the demands of supervising your own children's K-12 online learning in the case of our adult student population, and the lived emotional realities that may function or impact success rates include concerns about job security, meeting basic needs, and general COVID-related uncertainties. Next slide. So what we're trying to do is to provide resources that are vital to student success, to use some mechanisms to extend uh, equal access and equitable access and support to all of our student populations and to particularly empower these at-risk demographics. Uh, one more slide, if you would. We all know a lot of the technology impediments, and I won't go too far into these. Anybody that wants these slides afterwards, uh, feel free to contact me, and I'm, I'm happy to share them if you would continue. One more, I'm trying to wrap this up. I know I went a little bit over. Um, we did find with digital literacy that students with lower digital literacy skills face greater impediments, and the American Libraries Association defines digital, digital literacy is the ability to use information and communication technologies to find and evaluate information. Johannes found in his studies uh, with the Coelho Center and in a number of other studies, low digital literacy uh, has implications on SAT and PSAT and also intentions for higher education. So in conclusion, what I would like to share is that there are a number of us who are focusing on these impediments to student success and we're developing and deploying student research and student surveys to obtain a lot of the data for analysis on this in order to help support our potentially socioeconomically disadvantaged students. Once we have that information, uh, these groups are going to work with teachers and with administrators to develop a set of best practices in order to provide support and resources that are not only technologically, which may be the thing that people are the most aware of, but also to consider what the additional physical and emotional lived realities are of these students that may not be uh, being considered right now in all of our education institutions. So I look forward to a further discussion and again, apologize for my video connectivity issues. Thank you. No problem. We could hear you fine. Erin. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, so my name is Erin Huggins. I'm a research associate at the Friday Institute for Educational Innovation at NC State University, and I work on the research and evaluation team. Um, you can go on to the next slide. Uh, so a lot of the work that I do uh, really revolves around um, the homework gap and other digital equity issues. Um, now, when I say the homework gap, I'm referring to students that are assigned homework that requires access to the internet, but they don't have that access at home. Um, this problem is exacerbated often in rural and low income areas, and it's particularly problematic right now that most of the schools in the country have shifted to online learning. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, now, this has been an issue for um, many years um, and the increased requirement that students have to complete online work at home right now is widely considered one of the cruelest parts of this digital divide. Um, most of the work that I'm doing is actually still ongoing. Um, the slides that I just showed you were some of the results that we had from uh, a, a survey that we did statewide uh, in coordination with the Broadband Infrastructure Office and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, 
and the work that I'm currently doing, um, and I've been asked to speak about today, was uh, focusing on a, a Homework App Hotspot grant. Um, and this was a two-year ILMS grant that was given to the State of North Carolina and the Broadband, in, uh, the State Library of North Carolina and the Broadband Infrastructure Office. Um, and you can go to the next slide. Um, so this grant provided um, up to four libraries um, in the state, which are all in rural areas, hotspot devices, um, and it provided uh, monthly digital literacy trainings to families at those schools. Um, these workshops were provided once a month, and they targeted um, very specific skills, such as internet safety, um, interacting with students' education online, and things like that. Um, and then this information that we're um, and these workshops that we're developing are going to be curated and used to develop an online toolkit that can then be shared with uh, library systems across the country and hopefully provide a sustainable model for the future. Um, right now, we're at the very end of, uh, of this grant cycle, and um, we uh, have found some interesting things, and I'll talk a little bit more about the findings later. Um, if you'll go to the next slide. Oh, no, sorry, that is the next slide. Um, so a I wanted to briefly talk about some of the other initiatives that I'm working on as well. Um, the first one is uh, a needs assessment that I'm doing with Digital Durham. And Digital Durham is a collaborative that is operating in Durham, North Carolina, which is a fairly urban area. Um, and they promote digital literacy inclusion by advocating for reliable, affordable internet access and computer devices. And they also provide digital literacy training. So it's similar to the work we're doing with the Hotspot Grant, um, except for only focusing in Durham, North Carolina. Um, and this group consists of a collaboration of organizations that are all focused on closing the digital divide, each of whom have their own focus and initiatives um, that are either being implemented uh, in Durham or even in some cases across the entire state. Uh, they also provide a variety of different products and services to people in the community that aren't connected to the internet. Um, some of these include uh, loaner Wi-Fi hotspots, um, refurbished computers, they offer digital literacy uh, trainings to families. They also offer professional development to teachers. Um, and as I said earlier, I'm currently conducting a needs assessment with this group and I'm helping them to build a logic model so that they can then uh, develop a cohesive and sustainable um, collaborative moving forward. Um, another group that I'm working with is the new teacher support program. Um, the Friday Institute is currently conducting an evaluation with this program. Um, and they are a comprehensive university-based induction program that provides individual coaching, uh, regional professional development, and annual institute trainings to new teachers across nine regional university hubs. So they really do reach the entire state. Um, while the program has um, traditionally conducted face-to-face -face coaching as much as possible, they've had to move to virtual co coaching since the outbreak of COVID-19. Um, and while not part of our original evaluation, we have started the process of interviewing these coaches, trying to determine um, how they're now supporting these teachers and what impact they think that that is having not only on the teachers they're coaching, but also their students and their families. Um, and then the last, uh, the last program that I'm helping to evaluate is um, the work that we're doing with uh, our local PBS station, UNC TV, um, in coordination with our Department of Public Instruction. And they are currently implementing an at-home um, an at-home learning um, platform that is geared specifically towards students that do not have access to internet at home. Um, so, in order to address this issue, uh, both UNC TV and the Department of Public Instruction um, are providing free curriculum-informed over-the-air content that's more accessible to students that lack high-speed internet at their home. Um, and they're hoping that they're and they're pairing these educational shows with. Um, online as well as printed curriculum aligned resources that have been curated by both UNC TV and DPI um, and they're being provided uh, to the schools across the state um, and this is a, actually an initiative that is countrywide um, a lot of the local PBS stations are providing similar services um, in North Carolina UNC TV is going to be airing interstitials daily um, between shows that also uh, show some of our North Carolina teachers reaching directly out to their students and one of the goals of this effort is not only to provide educational content, but really to also help support students' uh, social and emotional well-being um, while they're at home. Um, we've you know, been finding that a lot of these students are feeling isolated, and one of the ways that uh, UNCTV is supporting this is by having teachers come on and give them encouraging messages and help them feel um, a little less isolated. 
Um, and so that's kind of a summary of uh, some of the activities that we are doing at the Friday Institute. If anyone has any questions about these, um, these projects that are ongoing, please feel free to reach out. Thanks, Aaron. Nick. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so like Heather said, my name is Nick Fisher. I am a school administrator uh, at the middle school level um, in my third year of that. Prior to that, I spent nine years teaching history and then seven of those as a department chair. Um, I will say that I do teach in, or administrator in a pretty affluent county um, in Virginia, but I do have experience in a very rural and impoverished area before I moved to the county that I'm currently in. Um, I will say everything that I'm talking on is kind of my own experiences. I'm not speaking on behalf of the county or the school. Um, so kind of don't think my own things that I've experienced. Um, our county uh, did close for the first full week uh, beginning Monday, March 16th. Uh, we actually closed earlier the week before. Um, many schools had prior notice that they were about to close, whereas ours came at five o'clock in the morning on a Thursday that said, you're closed um, for the next two weeks. And then we thought that we would be back somewhere around spring break, um, which ended on April 13th. And here we are still currently out. Um, so our official online teaching began about a week later. We spent that first week in between training teachers to use Google Classroom. Many of them already did use it, um, but the county decided that they wanted all teachers to use um, HyperDocs through Google uh, for consistency purposes. So there were a lot of teachers that had not used those previously. So there was a lot of training that went in with that. Um, there, all teaching that was done beginning March 23rd was a review of previously taught materials. Um, that was a recommendation from the state, uh, actually a requirement from the state uh, due to equity issues at that point. Um, as I said, we were expecting to return sometime around spring break and then later that week, uh, Governor Northam decided to close schools for the remainder of the year. Um, so we transitioned quite quickly into needing to roll out new information um, from there on out. So new information began being taught shortly after spring break. Um, we started using a program uh, for all core classes, so math, history, science, social studies, um, and also uh, EL students, uh, English learners. Uh, from the sixth grade level up to 12th grade, um, elementary schools had a different program, but Edmentum was something that was given to our county uh, for free because it was able to, to teach a lot of the standards that had not been taught yet um, and also met uh, Virginia's criteria. One of the issues we have run into with that is a lot of their information is based off of Common Core uh, and Virginia standards are not Common Core based. We have opted out of it. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the things that our school district started with was asynchronous learning. So we were using, as I mentioned, a lot of Google Classroom, HyperDocs, Edmentum. Uh, recently, towards the third week of April, uh, we started having synchronous office hours where teachers are required to have three office hours per week. So as a school, we had to come up with a schedule to where students have access to their teachers but don't overlap with a lot of their classes. So one of the things we decided was to have specific contents at a certain time. So if there were parents that had, say, a sixth grader and an eighth grader, they would be learning math at the same time. They'd be learning social studies at the same time. They'd have some of their electives at the same time. Um, we've been using Google Meet to do that. Uh, we were not doing live Google Meets for a while. Uh, one of the reasons the school district chose that was the security uh, and protecting students' information. Uh, and through that, we've been doing small group meetings, um, short instruction and Q&A sessions. Um, those are recorded and posted for students who are not able to view them live because we realize that families have a lot of different things going on. Um, so some students just can't do the synchronous learning. Um, if there is uh, recording going on, which we've now pushed out to all all Q, uh, Q and A's being recorded. There was need for parent permission to do that. So we had to roll out uh, kind of online permission forms for parents to give permission for their kids to be recorded. Uh, if they chose not to give permission to be recorded, uh, the students still can participate. They just do so with their camera off. Uh, and then also if there's any one-on-one -on -one teacher to student or counselor to student, uh, parents needed to be present and that's to protect both the students and the teachers. Uh, one of the things that our superintendent said to one of the, the school board meetings a couple weeks ago, uh, and they, they've ramped it up. They've been meeting once a week, uh, constantly making decisions um, and making changes. So we're kind of rolling with the punches, but he said to strive for growth, not for perfection. Teachers tend to like to be perfectionists and roll things out and hope that it goes perfect. Uh, and we've learned very quickly that the synchronous and asynchronous learning is not perfect, um, but we're learning and we're making changes as we go along. So some of the challenges um, is student participation. The first couple of weeks we had Pretty low uh, student participation. Our school um, is a little bit higher, um, higher need, uh, lower income area of our county. 
Um, so we are, are an, on a little bit on the low side of what the county is. Um, students also, many of them did not have an internet or computer. So two thirds of our schools were one to one. Uh, we did that over a three year wave. We have not hit that third year. So all of a sudden they needed to hand out about 1200 Chromebooks uh, to the schools that were not one to one. So not only are students learning new programs, they're also learning new devices as well. Um, the county purchased hotspots to roll out to students and teachers by request. Uh, we since have run out of those. Um, there were several hundred that were being given kind of on a per need basis. Uh, the priority was given to teachers without reliable internet because they need to be able to push out the information to their students. Um, and then also one of the things once they ran on hotspots was they opened up one of the schools for individual classroom use. So teachers can go and use an individual classroom to kind of keep up with social distancing protocol for teachers that don't have reliable internet. And a lot of things are changing through our Department of Instruction daily, hourly. Um, so it's one of those things that everybody wants answers, but sometimes there are things that are constantly changing. Next slide. Um, so another problem that we had to look into is how do we grade students when they're not in our classrooms? Uh, so what we decided was the third quarter uh, was extended and students were allowed to make up work. Uh, and that pushed out almost a month after the quarter was supposed to have already ended. Uh, the fourth quarter, for the guidelines of Virginia, it is that we are doing formative grades only uh, and work done can increase the student's grade. And that's kind of to give the students an incentive to continue doing the work. Uh, some students just don't respond as well to intrinsic motivation. They need something extrinsic. Um, and then also, and I'll get some of these more uh, with questions that Heather's going to ask later, but we have equity issue due to our access to our grading that we've had to take into account. Um, our special education services look a lot different when you have students with individualized education plans that need to be tweaked. Uh, mental health services need to be provided to some of our students and how those are provided in a, a virtual setting. There's been some hurdles with that. Um, students, some had done anything. There are students we have not heard since we closed on March 11th, um, but we have had multiple ways of trying to reach out to families and, and our, our student participation is continually increasing. Um, Student contact, we have groups of counselors who are reaching out to families uh, because we're trying to educate the whole child. You know, are there are things that you need food-wise, are there things that you need for internet, um, and trying to provide families with resources that are out there in our community. And then also trying to be proactive as much as we can, realizing that there's other issues that other counties surrounding us face. Um, so we move very slowly. Um, some other counties around us moved a little bit faster, um, and there were some technological hiccups that they ran into, and I'm sure that that's happening countywide. And I'll answer some questions here in a little bit. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. So anyway, I have some opening questions for people, but if you all have questions, please put them in the um, chat area where Pete will be calling them, if, I, if, if that's a good way to stay. But I wanted to start with Todd. And Todd, when you started connecting your K through 12 via fiber, did you ever envision that they would need to be able to deliver all distance learning over this network? Oh, I don't think anybody could have expected what we're going through right now. Um, I, I'm sure proud of what we've accomplished beforehand. I think it's given our community a, a good opportunity to, to stay connected and learn, but there's sure a lot of challenges we're still facing uh, and a lot of need. Are how much, what percentage of your students are connected and have devices? Oh, I don't know how well to answer that one there. I, I know there's, um, there's a lot of hotspots being deployed for folks who do not have connectivity, but being between the Cascade Range and the Coastal Range, uh, wireless signal is not um, not good, and so you need a connected device. I would guess 25% are sub subpar connectivity. And are they are there places they can go to to get better connectivity? I know most of us are homebound, but do they drive to parking lots or anything like that? Yes, yes, the schools have opened up hotspots in the parking lots and, and at the Grange Halls and, and places like that. Um, we've, we've not been involved in that due to, you know, filtering and, and those types of issues. Okay. Um, so, Johannes and Aaron, can both of you describe some of the results you have seen in studying broadband and the device access gaps? What have been some of the, I know you said that it, knocks down the amount of kids that go to college and pursue STEM. Have you seen any other glaring issues from it? Johannes? Yeah, I was, I was trying to be polite and let Aaron go. <laughs> <laughs> that was, 
if that's fine. I'd be happy to, to respond. So the one additional aspect that I'd like to highlight um, in, a, in, a, in a minute is there is a very sort of strong connection between type of access that students have at home and the level of digital skills they need. And the relationship is, is not necessarily one-on-one, -on -one, but what we do see is that the quality of your activity at home enables quite a number of other types of uh, activities that are inspired by the school, but go beyond it. So they, they contact uh, friends, they contact colleagues to work on projects. They do learn new types of search skills. We see that those who with better connectivity have a much broader range of activities that they do online. And so in some sense, the, the project game-like way of learning. And But in the end, the digital skills of those with better connectivity are way higher than those uh, with lower connectivity. And in fact, the, the, the difference was quite stunning. It was actually the difference between somebody in 12th grade and somebody in ninth grade. So it's like three grade levels difference in terms of the digital skills that they have. Now, fast forward a little bit. I mean, digital skills are not just important to get good grades in school, but they uh, they really carry you through your life in this in this digital day and age. Uh, they they will determine what your job opportunities are. They will determine how how qualified you are for different types of jobs, especially those that are emerging jobs that require higher digital skills. Uh, they they are related to, as I said before, to this choice whether to go to post secondary education or pursue STEM careers. And again. These are choices that have, over the course of a lifespan, they have major impacts. But we do know that people who have a uh, post-secondary education, on average, not the same for every career, but on average, they lead to uh, close to a million dollars more income over the course of their lifespan. Uh, that STEM careers, right, are typically higher paid careers. Again, there's variation, but on average, that's the case. And so we really uh, sort of, uh, there's a risk that we set entire families, communities on a, on a course course during the life that is that disadvantages them not only in terms of the grades that they get and the homework completion, but really the repercussions that those have for for the rest of their life. I must I want to say one more thing. I really appreciate hearing from from Todd and Nick and Aaron about the fantastic adapt adaptability that you showed in a very short timeline, very challenging timeline, right? To really work with whatever you have, the challenges that exist. To, to overcome sort of some of those issues. But I also would like to say that some of them probably will need some longer term thinking, right? That, that, uh, that those quick fixes only take us so far and, and uh, maybe we can explore this a little bit more in this, on this call. Yeah. Well, Aaron, didn't you see some downsides to your hotspot program? We did. Um, so I was briefly going to start talking about um, a broadband survey that we first sent out, which led then to the hotspot, the hotspot um, grant that I'm currently at the end of the evaluation. Um, so in 2017, the Broadband Infrastructure Office partnered with the Friday Institute to send out um, a broadband survey statewide to understand where the gaps actually existed. Um, that I think we ended up being able to collect about 10,000 responses and about 10,000 or about 10% of those respondents um, said that they did not have any internet access. Um, and in looking at that, I mean, not surprising, we found out that cost was one of the biggest barriers uh, to not being able to have access to the internet. Um, and we also found out that of those people that responded about 36% of those students um, were required to use a digital device to complete homework, but only about 55% of those students actually felt very comfortable doing so. Um, and, uh, and the survey provided us a lot of really useful information. However, we also realized um, that the survey we sent out didn't necessarily target uh, the population we were hoping um, we were hoping to target. Um, so they, I think, and this was before I started working for the Friday Institute. Um, I think the survey itself was sent out digitally. And so obviously we weren't able to um, connect with families that did not have access to the internet unless they were doing this over their phone. Um, but we do know about 98% of people are able to get some kind of connectivity over their phone. Um, 
So in thinking about that, um, when I've started my work with Digital Durham and the Hotspot Grant Program, when we targeted specific schools, we made sure that we were sending home paper surveys. I think just like Johannes said, and um, I believe somebody else um, said that they were doing that as well. Um, so we sent out, we sent out um, paper surveys to every student in, um, I believe we targeted middle schools for the Homework App Hotspot Grant and then K through 12th grade, 12th grade in Durham. Um, our Durham program has been put on hold, unfortunately, because of the COVID-19 outbreak. We were supposed to deploy these surveys in April, um, and we've been home since about March 15th. Um, so we were, were hoping to get that rolling in the fall. Um, but we have been able to wrap up most of our work with the Homework App Hotspot program. Um, and um, let's see, I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things that we have found um, in doing this program, and again, it was at four different rural locations across North Carolina where they were providing monthly digital literacy trainings, along with a hotspot device for each family. Um, what we found was that it really did seem to reduce the homework gap among our participants. We're looking at data analytics um, and the usage of the hotspot um, did increase um, across the time period that we were looking at. It also seemed to increase families access to online resources and tools. Um, and in most of the locations that we surveyed, um, it improved the relationships between the school, um, the, the schools and the library systems, which was one of the goals of the library grant. Uh, we did know, note, however, that participation rates in this program were much lower than we had expected. I think originally we anticipated being able to serve about 140 students. Um, and we ended up, I think, at the, I think our maximum number at one of the workshops um, was about 50 students across the entire state. Um, and so we did, we do know anecdotally um, that one of the reasons that students were not participating as much as we thought they would is because of the requirement for them to attend these workshops. But we also know that students and their families have to have the digital literacy skills, as someone else has already said, to be able to use the devices and connect to the internet in appropriate ways. Um, and so, and that's just been one of our biggest issues moving forward. Um, let's see. Um, another thing that we noticed was that um, the digital literacy skills of our families varied quite a lot. Um, we had some families that were coming in to do the workshops that literally had never turned on a computer before. And then we had a lot of other families coming in that um, were very proficient with um, the computer and using the internet and they used it for their job every day. The only issue was that they were not able to receive internet service at their home because they were in one of these rural counties where um, service just didn't exist. Um, and, um, and so one of the things that we've suggested as we start moving towards developing this online toolkit that can then be shared is that we want to make sure that when individuals are able to access these training materials that they can explore things based upon their needs. Um, and we think that that would help to improve um, some of the participant creation rates moving forward. Okay. Well, Todd and Nick, who are paying for the um, hotspots um, in your area? When you, I mean, Aaron had a, a grant. So who mm -hmm. are paying for the new hotspots being deployed in in your county, Nick, and in your area, Todd? So my understanding is that the school system was bought, I think 250 was the approximate number. Um, and that was with leftover year end funds when the schools decided to close. Um, everything was put, all spending was put on a freeze. So some of the unspent money from schools or the county was put into a fund to help fund a lot of the, the distance education and then also the prep for if this becomes long term into the fall. So my understanding is that that was paid with money that the county was gave to the school board. And Todd, who covered the hotspots in your area? Uh, the hotspots are covered by the Department of Education and the school systems themselves. We're covering the DFN CARES internally. The, you're covering the DFN? The fiber installs for the homes. Oh, okay. So you're paying for the installs and then the school system's giving them Wi-Fi hotspots? Uh, two separate things. Okay. Um, so are there any comments among the educators on how important it is for parents to be involved with the distance learning? And is their involvement a guarantee of better success? I think 
Yeah, I think it's instrumental. Um, and I think that's one of the equity issues that we face is that we have students who have parents at home that are able to help. We have parents that are working from home. We have some that are essential employees working long hours a day. So you've got the kids watching each other. So there definitely, I think, is from a work completion basis, uh, more kids who have the parent input are doing better with this. Um, so and that's something that we keep looking at as a county is how to you know, bridge that equity gap because, you know, it's like a, it's an onion. When you start peeling back, the deeper you get, the more entrenched, as Johannes brought up, uh, I think it was in his, you know, based off of the internet that the students have, the support systems, all of that just kind of ends up compounding itself over time. So, Aaron, have you seen any ramifications of parental involvement? Well, you saw that they weren't, the kids weren't as engaged, right? Right. Well, right now we are in the process of deploying a statewide survey um, asking parents and teachers, um, you know, how they're able to access materials online. It's one of the goals of the UNC TV work that we're doing is to be able to um, bridge some of these gaps. We know it's not going to be perfect, um, you know, but at least being able to provide some um, standards aligned educational content on our TV channels that can reach all students, um, well, most students across the state, um, is gonna help bridge that divide a little bit. Um, but we are seeing that there are like, similar problems in North Carolina. Um, some families are first responders um, and healthcare workers, and they are at, they're at work all day. Um, I think some of the daycare centers are open to those families right now, but I don't know what kinds of um, services they're able to provide for the families. But, you know, myself, I'm a mother of two school-age children. And so, you know, I'm in the boat of trying to work and trying to manage their school. And, um, you know, and I'm fortunate enough to have a job, but we've also got families who, for whom, um, you know, this is the last thing on their minds. We've got families that are worried about, you know, putting food on the table or keeping their homes. And it just, it varies so much. Um, and I'm, you know, am worried about how this is going to affect our students um, if this continues long term. And that leads me to my question for Perrette, per, um, because I know that you've done some work um, um, in your PhD uh, work research on social inequities that you see in distance learning. And could you say a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. You can hear me okay? Yep. Lovely. Yeah, we have absolutely looked at that, which is why our studies uh, at the University of Toledo and some of the other universities in Ohio are looking at that reality pedagogy as our framework. Um, there are, as I mentioned in my presentation, there are obviously connectivity issues which speak very greatly about the, the access and impediments for that for both K-12 and for um, our college students and our parents who are also college students, but the impediments of the emotional realities of, I don't have my basic needs met, I have uncertainty about it, I don't have a physical space in my home to connect, I am now caring for aging parents, caring for, for the students in my household, or even COVID-related uncertainties. Maybe I have someone in my family who is sick or I'm worried about someone getting sick. A lot of these things are emotionally and technologically impacting our student populations. And um, when you look at those, and then you also look at our instructors, these, these issues are not just limited to the students. These issues are also uh, things to our teachers and our professors and you know, our university administrators. We have a, a large number of instructors and professors who've never taught an online course before. So now I'm a professor who has this huge workload, or maybe I'm a department chair and also a professor with this huge workload. And now I've also got to immediately figure out how to deploy things, but I have these same exact concerns in my very own home. And now I also have to not only technologically support my students, but I'm also, you know, we're all acting as counselors for each other right now. So I'm also catering to the emotional needs and the concerns of my students. I may need to alter my lesson plans. I may have to 
be a little bit more forgiving. If we have final presentations and I have a student who can't connect or who is ill or whose toddler won't stop screaming, you know, on the phone because they have an earache, so they're trying to present. So it, it's an entirely different world here. So I, I don't mean to put Todd on the spot, but you have a a high school math teacher in your household, don't you? Yes, yes. How, how is she coping with all of this? Uh, it's, it's all brand new. Um, I'll get up and she'll be filming lessons in the morning. She'll have the camera on her hand as she's doing the math. Um, we've had to learn to be quiet as we walk through the house as she teaches. So it's all brand new. It is. And Nick, did have you had specific training for your teachers? Um, we've had trainings and stuff if, as far as how to utilize a lot of the computer programs and things like that. But naturally, you're going to have staff who are more comfortable than others. Um, so I think it's one of those things where not only we're we meeting our kids where we're at, we're meeting our teachers where they're at. Um, we do have for our school staff check-ins and Q&As um, with our administrative team every Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, kind of to roll out new information to answer questions to give feedback. Um, our school has an instructional facilitator um, on our staff who also meets with teachers uh, when they're having their planning sessions and things like that. And you know, like like everybody else is saying here, every family has different scenarios that they're facing. Uh, so one of the things we've urged with our staff is, you know, be there to support the kids. And if a kid can give you a little bit of work, great. And if they can give you all the work, fantastic. But you know, we've got to be sympathetic and, and, you know, do what's best for, for each and every one of our kids. And when you've got 1,300 kids, that can be difficult. But, you know, we've got to take everything one step at a time and realize that every family does have different scenarios. And, you know, as was brought up earlier, family members sick. We've had students' families who have passed away due to COVID. Um, and it's, it's unrealistic to expect them to be putting forth full amounts of work when, you know, their family's basically in survival mode. So I think it's just meeting every kid where they're at and being sympathetic to the situation. And hopefully when schools do open back up, teachers will do what they do best and, you know, catch the kids back up and do what they need to. It is really terrifying when you think about the kids going through not only the distance learning part, but the economic uncertainty that's been, that surrounds, you know, everyone because of being involved in the shutdown. Um, Looking forward, are we going to be ready for fall? I mean, Todd, or do you think your network's ready if we don't go back to school? Um, Nick and Aaron, uh, Pierrette and Johannes, are the teachers ready? Are the systems ready? I mean, how did, how will we figure this out um, if the teachers are done? The teachers and students are done in June. How do we? get ready for the fall and make sure either we're ready to open in a distance learning or in some sort of um you know some sort of combination in order to maintain social distance in the schools so i'll start off with the guy who has to do the network first todd and see if you anticipate any changes and then i'll go to each of you and see what you say about it uh the network's ready the uh, last mile is going to be the challenge for the household for the household. Yeah. Just like it is now. Yes. Okay. Um, Johannes, are you seeing anything in your studies that indicate how we're going to be ready for fall or any requirements coming up? So, so lawn mowing service, which is authorized to do the lawn since uh, earlier this week in Michigan is here. So I'm not sure whether this is really creating a lot of background noise. So if it does, let me know and I'll pass to somebody else. If not, here's a couple of things. Let me throw in a university perspective because I, uh, it's not only K through 12 that moved online, but also universities. And, and I thought the first online course probably 25 some years ago. And it is amazing how we still struggle with moving our entire operation online. And again, it's the same factors that are in place, the, the connectivity is lacking. We, we know too little actually about where our students are and what kind of connectivity they have. Although the university has sort of computer requirements, when once they move home, then they don't have the same devices. So we see a replication of those things that we just discussed. My own, my own guess is most likely most of these pandemics, they work in waves. 
right? And so I think we to to be to plan well, I think one would have to sort of look forward and say, okay, how can we develop like a, a second or multiple modes of teaching? And I think what I hear from from everybody who was is on this webinar is is that one solution doesn't work for everybody. And so I think there need to be multiple solutions that we can use. We need to learn to flexibly and adaptively use uh, different types of technologies. And we, we know that there's different learning types right? in, in, our, in our university population, I see the daily. Some individuals learn very well online, other students don't learn well online. They need extra help. And I'm, I'm really encouraged by all the initiatives that I, that I sort of heard you talk about, right? where you have built systems that help at multiple levels. And, and so we do need to build the infrastructure, clearly that's 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 uh, to places where it doesn't reach. We do make, need to make sure that people have the devices, but we also need to create those sort of social support systems that Nick uh, and, and Aaron both mentioned and, and Todd also alluded to. And I know, Pirat, you've seen some of that um, agony from kids, from people being anxious about distance learning, haven't you? You know, I have, and I have heard this about um, employees from a, a management perspective, but I think that this little piece of advice, this anecdote is something that we should probably keep in mind too, as far as our students go. We're not working from home. We are home during the largest pandemic crisis we've ever seen, hopefully in our lifetimes, also trying to do some work. And I think that mindset should be the first thing that we're thinking about with our students. These students are not doing online school. These students are trying to survive the best they can during the largest crisis of our time and also get an education as they are able to. And I think that, um, you know, to a degree, Nick also mentioned that if the students can get some work in, that's great. If they can't, that's great too. So. I would say, you know, a, a couple of things, um, you know, looking not only to the future of the fall, but also looking forward to the future future, uh, these disparities in technology, broadband access, digital literacy, um, you know, even just the way that these technologies are funded at a national level and state level and the, the leadership that you can look at from um, curriculum standards nationally, statewide, and locally, these are all disparities uh, that the Michigan Moonshot has been hoping to work towards and addressing for the past year and a half, others certainly much longer than we have. And this is not going to be the last instance of this. So, you know, I would say as someone who's not a typical educator, um, but who straddles both of these spheres between networking and education, let's obviously work together to patch this situation moving forward as best we can. As Johannes mentioned, these waves are going to come, but also let's use this to examine the larger societal problems that are creating this issue in the first place, because this isn't the last time this is going to happen. So this is a crisis and a version of this will continue to occur unless we look at the, the larger long-term implications of funding and infrastructure and how we're all working together. Erin, what are your thoughts there? Um, I completely agree with everything that Pierre Wett and Johannes just said. Um, I mean, it's a very, very real possibility that we are going to have to continue um, doing online learning once the fall hits. And I would just like to take a moment to celebrate everything that our teachers have been doing so far because they have done an amazing job of adapting um, to this situation um, and, and dealing with something that they've never been trained to do. Um, you know, I think they are doing their best not only to support our students' um, education, but also to support their social and emotional well-being. Um, and I just want to applaud all of them. Um, you know, but I don't know how we can deploy, um, as Johannes was saying, one statewide model or one national model when we still have such huge discrepancies in those that have access. Um, so I do think if this happens in the fall, it's going to be you know, a blend of different um, types of learning. And I think there are gonna be huge discrepancies for those families that have access and those that don't, and those that have a parent in the house that can sit and help them with their work and those that don't. 
Um, you know, and it really does shine a light on this digital divide that is, I think, one of the biggest equity issues that we're facing today. I mean, we know now, like we've known for years that internet is, internet access isn't a luxury. Um, we need it for many things beyond um, just schoolwork. I mean, accessing health information services, getting our news, um, being able to apply for jobs, being able to work remotely. Um, just connecting with our family and banking and shopping. I mean, there's so many things that we need to have access for that I don't think that we can say that this is just a good to have service any longer. Like I really think as a nation, we need to focus on providing this reliable, reliable universal deployment of internet and, um, and devices and think about it in, in longer terms than just providing a Band-Aid. Um, you know, we can't continue to have, you know, these patchworks of different initiatives that are really not addressing the systemic problems that we've got. So um, we have a lot of work to do. Nick, you get to close it down here. <laughs> I hope I can put this together coherently because I've had so many thought bubbles and I've taken notes as you guys have gone through. Um, Johannes brought up a great point earlier of the short term versus the long term. Um, and I think that you know these couple months through June is our short term where we learn and we spend the summer. And like I said, our school board is meeting weekly now. They used to meet every other week. Um, they've agreed to meet through the summer. Um, hopefully we get a chance to open in August. As we've said before, I don't know that that is a realistic possibility. Um, but even looking long term, I mean, is if we go through January or we go through next year, like is that short term or is that long term? Looking at that right now is long term, but it's one of those things of where you have to prepare and, and our school board for our county is looking kind of at three different models one where we open in august and you know what do we do there's one that says you know we open but under severe social distancing so can you put 1300 kids in a school in that no you definitely can't um and then there's one of we continue the online learning and there's a lot of overlap with those so kind of preparing for maybe you do open at some point and then shut back down um, and I think there's a big difference between having utilized technology in education to going 100% computer-based, internet-based. Um, and that's a huge jump. Um, as Aaron said, you know, teachers haven't been trained for that. They've been trained to use a program here or there or, you know, utilizing the kids' Chromebooks. But to full-fledged within a matter of hours, like they left school on a Wednesday, coming in on a Thursday, and then all of a sudden, you know, everything's online. So that's that's a huge jump. Um, and we did, we took it slow for people to become more comfortable um, before we rolled it out with the kids. We took it slow with the kids. So I think really now, almost a month and a half later, we're starting to hit our stride. And I think if we are closed down in the fall, you know, we grow from what we know now. My biggest issue I think that the teachers will have with that is you've had your time to set up things this year with kids and you're missing out on the end. When you open up with a brand new set of kids completely online, you know, those relationship building aspects and things that you spend so much time in the beginning of the year doing to to make the big differences at the end of the year and now here the end of the year is somewhat taken away from us so um you know you guys have said thank you to teachers i want to thank you guys as parents and family members uh for you know trying to provide that continuity of education to your family and i'll echo again you know you got to do what's best for your kids um hopefully at some point we could have national internet um but i think in the long run you still have to have the states and the localities that respond to the immediate needs of their area. Um, so th I think that maybe was a little bit rambling and incoherent, but it's one of those things that it's the reality now. And, you know, we just kind of learn as we go and make changes and tweak. And I think that that's one of the problems that we've, we've had is conversation with the community as we've rolled out new information. But, you know, if a parent misses an email or misses a phone call that's pushed out, you know, how much information are they missing? And, and where do they go from there? So it's a learning experience for everybody. It really is. It has been a learning experience. And um, um, I wanted to thank you all for joining us today. I wanted to thank my audience and tell them to watch for the um, access to the recording. I think all five of you pointed out something that I feel very passionately about, which is better broadband in, in all of our communities and the challenges um, to get that. Um, I mean, Todd, Todd's community is very fortunate that Douglas Fastnet was found a way to deploy. And so this small corner of Oregon has some of the, has the best access around. Um, but for each of us, 
um, all of us are involved in the community and it sort of behooves each of us that have these touch points on education to speak up and as Aaron said, make people know how critical it is. I think, you know, Hannes showed us the facts um, and we all know that it's a challenge to get broadband deployed, but we all now know after this pandemic how critical it is. And so for that, I wanted to thank you all for your message and I wanted to thank you for spending time with us. So have a nice weekend and thanks. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Did you turn off the? Okay. Can you hear me? I think we're done. I think we're good. I, oh, good. Okay. Well, thank you okay. guys. I think that went really well. I really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank thanks you. for having us on. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. That was that was uh, that was great. Mm -hmm. I mean, now I'm, I'm really curious to hear more about Todd and Nick's and. and <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely so think we should sure. follow. Yeah, we <laughs> should definitely follow up with each other's work. I really want to go visit Todd because I love that part of the world. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, so um, thanks, thanks, Heather, for organizing this. And uh, okay, well, thank you guys. You for hearing us someplace. <laughs> yeah, appreciate all your support. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Take thank care. You guys. Bye. Bye. Exit.